In this two-part series, Craig Migliaccio from AC Service Tech came down to our apprentice school at Lake Technical College in Eustis, Florida, and did a couple different classes. This is a two-part series on ductless mini split systems. And in this first version, we're gonna talk through the air conditioning mode on ductless systems. So we've got two slides. This is in the air conditioning mode, and then we have in heating mode. Does anybody know why uh, both the large line and the small line have insulation over top of them on a mini split? So it doesn't absorb the outdoor temperature of heat. The heat surrounding it when it's traveling through the building. What's the other reason? What is it? Are they both section lines, essentially? So in this case, you have uh, both low pressure lines, uh, and that's because the metering device is outside. Uh, yes, and, and how does that end up affecting, if you didn't, if you didn't have insulation and the, the line set was traveling through the inside of the building, what would happen? When you take readings, you wouldn't know the right amount of superheat that you have because you're absorbing all that much heat from the outside. What were you going to say? You'll pick up heat as it travels. Okay. So what's going to also happen, yes, that those things are definitely going to occur, but the, the, probably the biggest thing to the building is... is sweating thank you. And yep. ruining the building. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Both are going to be low in temperature, and it's going to attract humidity. It's going to condense on the tubing, and it's going to drip down, messing up the building. Yep. Good. So that's different than a regular air conditioning system because the metering device in a standard air conditioning system is going to be at the... Uh, the indoor head unit. In a, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> in a regular air conditioning system, the thermostatic expansion valve is going to be right at the inlet of the evaporator coil. In this case, we have a mini split system, so we have an EEV electric expansion valve at the outdoor unit. And it has a stepper motor, and it's able to very, very precisely uh, be able to uh, bring up and down that rod in the center. And so you have a permanent magnet in the center, and you have your your, your wire coils, it looks like it's two, but you have multiple different wires and, you, and it's, it's just stepping, stepping and turning, turning this needle up and down on the inside of there. So, kind of hard to see, but. Right here you have your reversing valve. And uh, so, so right now we're in air conditioning mode. So this is all low in temperature because you're, uh, the refrigerant's absorbing heat from the inside of the building. Out here you're rejecting heat to the outdoor air. So step one is the compressor inlet. So you have your low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant entering into the compressor. Does anybody know what the accumulator, what the accumulator's job is? Does anybody know that? Keep the compressor from slugging. What do you got? Keep the compressor from slugging. Yes, keep the compressor from slugging. So it's, it's safeguarding the compressor, making sure only vapor enters the compressor. Good. Uh, what, what else does the accumulator do? Stores, stores refrigerant, right. So a, a mini split a lot of times has a VRF compressor and it may only be, uh, it, it's not using as much refrigerant when you have a, a lower heat load in the building. If you're trying to drop the temperature quickly with a mini split, you can ramp that compressor all the way up using your remote in order to reduce the humidity and temperature inside the building quickly. And so depending on how much refrigerant is being used, like we said before, a, a metering device such as a thermostatic expansion valve or in this case it's the EEV with multiple temp sensors monitoring the superheat, the subcoiling and line temperatures, it's able to efficiently uh, create a saturated state in here and it can even, a lot of times it runs in a saturated state that may be say six or eight degrees. In fact, you may even find that the total superheat on a running uh, mini split system may be zero zero degrees of superheat and the reason is they have the accumulator on them to protect the compressor and they're making the the the, the best use of the space within the the coil at the indoor unit so you might find anywhere from say zero to five degrees even you know uh, of total superheat if you were to measure right here now a lot of the manufacturers don't want us to check subcooling and superheat and that's a lot of times why they don't put a another pressure point right here uh, they don't want to confuse you compared to a single or two-speed standard split system. You just have your 
your, your mini split here that can ramp up or down depending on the heat load. Uh, so good. Now you're going to have either a two pipe or a single pipe. Every time you have a rotary compressor like this, your rotary compressors are all popular on the, on the outdoor mini split units. You're going to always have an accumulator mounted to the side. You may have just one or you might have a second one as well. You may have one before this one and that one is acting more, of a, more as a storage vessel for the refrigerant and this one is more so safeguarding the compressor. So inside the accumulator you have these little holes at the bottom where it's sucking in the oil and, and liquid refrigerant but it's really trying to get the oil and bring it in because you'll just have oil gather up in this whole thing but it sucks it in and any liquid refrigerant it phase changes it because of the small little orifice, the little hole into the vapor line and then goes into the compressor to lubricate the parts in here. So sometimes you'll have a screen up here to help vaporize it as well uh, up at the top. Depends on the accumulator style. So you can have one or two accumulators in a mini split. Uh, sometimes these are called ductless. I think, I think you call them ductless a lot, right, Brian? Yeah. Yeah, yeah ductless. And then uh, you can call them ductless, mini split. I, that's why I put both words up here at the top. So you got your low pressure refrigerant entering the compressor. Then you have your high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant exiting. And then you have your discharge line. It's going into the single side of the reversing valve. So then it enters the reversing valve and, and there's, there's, let me see here. Yep, there's the up close. We'll get to that in a second. But basically you have your discharge gas traveling across the side and then over to the outdoor coil during air conditioning mode. So here's the up close of the reversing valve. Here you have your solenoid valve over here. Here you have a pilot valve and you have four little tubes that are attached there. And so what's happening is this little tiny pilot tube, it is, and I like how you just referred to that in your, in your last video, but, but that is a little mini reversing valve basically. So basically what you're doing is based on the, the solenoid valve position, what you're doing is you're applying pressure to one side of the reversing valve and you're pushing the slide over and you're connecting these two over here and there's a little Teflon seal and it just rides across there. It's loose on the inside of this reversing valve. This high pressure that's surrounding it is pushing down on it and there's a brass plate on the inside. And so it slides back and forth, but it, it can slide easily. Um, just ba it just, it's just sealing it based on the pressure above it. But anyway, you have high pressure entering this side and you have low pressure over here. So the high pressure is able to push it across. If the refrigerant charge is too low, then that reversing valve is not going to operate correctly. It's not going to shift over. But in this case, it's, it's traveling on the outside. And during heating mode, it would come across over here, and this slide would be over here. So wherever the slide is, that's your low pressure. So you have your vapor de superheating. So superheat is the temperature increase above the state, uh, above the uh, saturated temperature. So basically, you know, if you're all the way up at, say, 170 degrees or something like that, you're rejecting heat and lowering in temperature as a vapor, and that's called de-superheating. All these fancy words that we use that, you know, you just kind of want to know. It's just lowering in temperature as a vapor refrigerant. And then it enters a saturated state once again, and where liquid and vapor both exist. You have your saturated state where it's, it's locked at a certain temperature right as it enters where vapor and liquid exist until it comes out and a, and a good temperature to say be maybe 100 degrees and then where it comes out it may be 90 degrees and so that's your your 10 degrees of subcooling so anyway it comes out say at 100 degrees the temperature uh, the lowering of the liquid refrigerant temperature between here and here that is uh, your subcooling if it's a single zone unit, a lot of times there's no access port to be measuring the liquid line pressure. So you, you don't have access to that. However, you could potentially place temp probes in, in spots to, to take a subcooling reading, but they want you to stay away from that. And they want you to just on mini split systems to, if you think that it's low on refrigerant, to recover all the refrigerant, check for leaks, fix the leaks, pre pressure test it, then vacuum pump it, then weigh in the correct amount of refrigerant based on the rating plate on the outdoor unit plus any additional feet past what the unit comes with as far as the refrigerant. So if this is, if it comes with enough refrigerant for 50 feet and you have 65 feet from, from the outdoor unit to the indoor head unit, then you have to add that additional 15 foot worth of refrigerant uh, into the system when you break the vacuum with 
uh, liquid refrigerant uh, from the bottle. The other nice thing about it is it has an accumulator. So if you only have one pour, you know, you usually break the vacuum with liquid refrigerant into the liquid side. In this case, you know, you may only be stuck with the vapor side. You may not be able to weigh in the full amount because this is bigger, uh, a bigger tube than this. Um, but you're going to get all of that liquid refrigerant into that system that you know needs to happen, even if it has to happen while the system's running. You can also uh, increase the temperature on your bottle. So if this is off, you can increase the temperature of the bottle to push more refrigerant into the system. That's a good way of doing it um, to, to try to get the correct amount of refrigerant before you turn the unit on. Does anybody have any questions yet? It's especially important when it's uh, low ambient temperatures. You can use like a, a heating blanket or something right. like that. Do that safely. Don't go putting a torch in your tank. Or yes. Something. Yep. Yeah, they just make a, a plug-in heater that you strap around the tank. Increases the temperature, which increases pressure, which then you can measure it with your scale. You just kind of have to tear the, tear the scale out with the heating blanket on it, and you can see how much additional refrigerant you're getting into that system. So that's how you would do that if the system is off. So subcooled liquid enters the EEV. Here's up close of the EEV. This pathway right here is a little bit more elongated and has like different sections of different cones. The, the variance or the, 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 the small area is very, very precise on these EEV systems. So you have your stepper motor right here and you're just, it's just turning this. And if you were to ever recover refrigerant out of a mini split unit and you turn the, the power off to the system, you can pull the head off and you can take a permanent magnet and, and turn it counterclockwise so this, this section is all the way up. You're, you're not going to be able to over um, extend it you know, upwards. It's going to just kind of ride at the top of the thread so when it turns back on again, the motor is going to kind of reset itself and it's going to get back onto the threads again. So that's a way to open up this pathway for, for recovery is to take that, turn the power off, take the head off, permanent magnet, counterclockwise, it opens up the pathway for you. Any questions on that? That's good stuff right there. Yeah. That's actually good, that's really good knowledge. Oh, here's an up close view of the, uh, well, it's just a little tiny hole. These are little, like little metering devices, but really all it's like a little, it's like taking an awl on the side of a pipe and there's a bing like that and it makes a tiny little hole. That's really all this is here and here. It's trying to suck the oil that gets stuck in the bottom of this tank back into the vapor line so it goes into the compressor so you don't just fill this up with, with uh, refrigerant oil instead of liquid refrigerant. And you got to remember that liquid, uh, I'm sorry, oil goes through the entire system with the refrigerant. So it's important that, that the refrigerant's traveling at the right velocity. It's, it's, it's missable with the, the oil is missable with the refrigerant and it, the refrigerant's carrying the oil throughout the whole system. So it's important to use the right refrigerant oil that mixes with that refrigerant that you have in the system. And that's why you see um, the different alternative refrigerants, uh, retrofit refrigerants for R22. They're really, the reason they have six refrigerants in, in them to try to maybe get to the right mixture is they're trying to grab a hold of the oil as it as it as the refrigerant travels through the system that's the hard part about the retrofit refrigerants that's why they add say a uh, semi flammable refrigerant you know or partially flammable refrigerant in that mix but when you add it in the mix the refrigerant's not labeled as flammable because of the mixture anyway right here you see uh, the refrigerant even though it's, it's, it has to travel all the way to the evaporator quill, it's going to be less vapor than normal uh, because of the uh, size of the tube, but you're still going to have some little bit of vaporization that's going to occur in, in the small little quarter inch tube. If this is, this tube may be three eighths of an inch, and that's three eighths OD, which is outside diameter. It's also referred to as ACR. It's also referred to as soft copper, but but basically, this is, this is usually a quarter inch, and this is usually three eighths, but this could also be um, five sixteenths or another size to uh, try to increase the capacity for, especially during heating mode. All right, so you have your liquid refrigerant, your low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant after it exits the, meter, exits the metering device, goes through the two position service valve uh, and, uh, and, and through, or three position. It's going through your service valve and traveling to your indoor unit 
And so we kind of have this blanked off right here because you don't know how it's traveling. It's hard to get both of these items on the same picture, so that's why there's a little kind of gap. But this could be traveling 20, 30 foot horizontally or whatever before it gets to that indoor head unit. So you have your liquid enters the indoor coil. It comes right into the side right here, and it immediately is in the saturated or the phase change that's occurring. And like I said before, the mini splits can operate with an extremely low total superheat, and that gives it the ability. Have you ever, guys ever noticed that the, the delta T on mini splits can be higher than a standard system? Has anybody noticed that? That's because of the, they use a better availability of the space in the evaporator coil. The superheat is lower. And so it can safeguard the compressor and run with a lower superheat and it just depends on what uh, fan speed you're running it at, if it's automatically controlled or you're overriding it with the, with the air uh, speed with the remote. Uh, but that's also why they don't want you necessarily checking total superheat and subcoing. But I will tell you that if you check this and you're noticing an extremely high superheat or total superheat out here, that's an indication that you have low refrigerant charge. So though you can't really check the refrigerant charge by using the ports, depending on the unit and usually they don't give you a guide to check the charge you know i don't know you know if you depending on the manufacturers you're working with but if you do find a high total superheat it's a pure indication that you are low on refrigerant you don't have enough refrigerant filling filling out this whole evaporator coil you know you have a leak so then you got to get to searching and finding finding where the leak and the obvious first place is to start is at the at the flare joints and you you can get away from flaring at the indoor head unit by flowing nitrogen through while brazing during an initial setup. Uh, you got to talk to your manufacturer about that as far as warranties go, so I'm not advocating that, but I said you can do it if you flow nitrogen through, so you're not getting oxidation inside the tubing, but you're not going to get away from these flares down here. So you're still going to have to do some flaring work on the mini split units. So the superheating begins when it comes out of the, out of the saturated phase change in state. And here's your superheat where the vapor, say, increases from 40 degrees. So it's 40 degrees here, 40 degrees here, 40, 40, 40, 40. The entire time while the refrigerant is absorbing heat, it is changing from a purely liquid, purely liquid state to mainly vapor and a little bit of liquid until it comes out as a, um, as a vapor. That's the phase change. That's the secret to the entire thing working. So you have your superheat. There's your total superheat. Once again, if you measure your pressure here, you convert it to saturated temperature. You're measuring the, you're trying to find what the saturated temperature is here. Your line temperature will be higher than whatever your saturated temperature is. And in the case of subcoiling, it's the, it's the opposite. You know, your, your, but I'll, I'll, I'll go over that maybe on the other one. You have your vapor travels in through the service valve, back through the reversing valve, and in through uh, this little slide mechanism. And then it goes into the accumulator where the accumulator protects the compressor from liquid slugging and, and allows the, um, the refrigerant level to come up in, in the accumulator tank without the compressor getting slugged. Some of these are a single rotary, some are dual rotary, depending on the size of the unit. That's that one, and we'll get into heating mode. Any questions? To find out more about Craig and everything he has to offer, please go to acservicetech.com or subscribe to his channel by searching AC Service Tech. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing. You can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.